What is socialism and why does it fail? Part 1. The Theory Socialism is a range of political, social, and economic theories characterized by the production and redistributions of goods being controlled collectively. Socialism also means the egalitarian or equal redistribution of wealth through the collective ownership of the means of production. The means of production is referring to the land, labor, and capital needed to produce goods and services, also called consumer goods. Socialists typically use the phrase worker control of the means of production, meaning that the workers will be in control of the land, labor, and capital needed to produce consumer goods. Socialists argue that the workers should receive everything that they produce from their work rather than just a small portion. They believe that the capitalists and business owners are confiscating the wealth generated by the workers' labor to serve only their interests, that profit is nothing more than theft and exploitation. In theory, this sounds great. Workers receive full value for their work and they can democratically decide how to run a business, making it beneficial for everyone, not just the owner. However, these advocates of the work and control of the means of production fundamentally misunderstand human behavior and economics. There are a few reasons why it is not only impractical to give workers control over the means of production, but also unethical. First of all, the reason why the business was created in the first place was the profit incentive. The entrepreneur, when starting the business, didn't create it out of sheer willpower to help the people. He created it because he thought that he had a chance of making profit. If the entrepreneur could somehow predict the future and knew that he was going to lose money for sustaining and creating the business, he would never start it. People naturally want to do things out of their own self-interest, which they want to gain something from doing an action, even if it's not a monetary gain. Think about it. Why would you plant 100 seeds to harvest 50? No, you plant 100 seeds to harvest 1,000. And every action, regardless of it is starting a business, voluntarily working for someone else, voluntarily exchanging property, planting seeds to harvest food, or any other activity or action done by humans, it is done for gain for profit. The entrepreneur risked wealth to start a business, provided other people with jobs at his own expense and created a good or service which people might want or not. If the business fails at selling the product, the entrepreneur is the one who loses his money he invested in the business and he could possibly go bankrupt. The people who work for the business on the other hand, their savings are unaffected because they did not invest into the business. This is a primary reason why the workers don't have the right to own the business. They did not spend the money to start and organize it. They are not the ones who created jobs for other people, and they are not the providers of a product for consumers. The capital goods which are used to make consumer goods, such as machinery, equipment, vehicles, tools, and other devices and instruments, are provided by the owner of a business or company for the workers to use. The workers only deserve their voluntarily agreed upon wage, as this is the real value of their work, which is determined by market forces such as supply and demand. As explained in my last video, profit is not exploitation, workers are not being exploited and profit is not the money stolen from the value of their labor. Instead, profit is a reward for creating value and supplying the needs of the consumers. In addition, profit can also be used to expand your business to create more jobs for workers which will fulfill their own needs and mass produce even more products, further increasing supply and reducing costs. Hiring people for work is not exploitation due to being voluntarily, voluntary, meaning that they agree to work for you. The reason for, for the process happening is the subjective theory of value, which assumes that both sides benefit from the arrangement. So now, it, so now it has been established why the entrepreneur makes profits and why he deserves to keep them. The socialists also typically define workers as the ones who are purely unskilled, make low wages, and the ones who are quote-unquote the most oppressed, meaning the ones whose work is not very valuable because it is common and easy to find people with similar attributes as theirs. Anyone can be a worker under capitalism. The only reason the entrepreneur even has the money to invest in a business is due to his parents, grandparents, or another member of his family working to achieve the level of wealth which the entrepreneur inherited. However, socialism isn't all that simple. It isn't just the worker control of the means of production. It is far more than that. Another element of so another key element of socialism is the e is the equal redistribution of wealth and capital. 
and that everyone will receive what they need according to their abilities. This is based off Marx's quote, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. According to socialists, this will make the society more equal and fair, as everyone will receive what they need to live, along with working to produce things which everyone needs. Firstly, this is completely impossible due to human behavior. As I explained already, people do things because they have an incentive to, and that incentive in a market economy is profit, regardless of it being an, an investment or a wage. Under socialism, this incentive doesn't exist, as everyone gets the same thing, no matter how much or how little you work. Under Marx's theoretical higher stage of communism, there is no price for goods and services. That means that everyone can just freely get them. Without prices, there would be no way to dictate the supply and demand for a product, making it impossible to have incentives for production to know how much of something is going to be produced. Marx assumes that people will be responsible and work for the benefit of everyone, even without incentives. Be honest, if you had the opportunity to get something for free and not work, most people will take this opportunity. The higher stage of communism could be described as people taking without producing until there's nothing left to take, resulting in the complete destruction and ca resulting in the complete destruction of society. Marx believed that human nature could be changed depending on the environment. However, this is a flat out lie. Certain behaviors are ingrained in us because this is the way to preserve and spread our genes for us to expand as a species. Now, moving on to a more realistic example of equal redistribution of wealth. Let's just say that people that the people choose using the monopolistic and total power of the state to equally redistribute Elon Musk's wealth, the richest person in the world. The net worth of Elon Musk is 215 billion dollars and the population of the United States of America is 200 is 334 million people. If we evenly divide Elon Musk's wealth, all Americans would gain $643.71. That is a very small amount of money, which a person can do almost nothing with. However, there will be an economic regression caused by stealing and redistributing Elon Musk's hard-earned wealth and destroying the businesses he owns. Elon Musk currently employs 110,000 people, and all of those people will be left unemployed, and the goods and services they work to produce would be halted. This means that all of Musk's developments, the Tesla, the Falcon rocket, the Hyperloop, PayPal e-payments, and many other products that improve people's lives would cease to exist in the market. In addition, Musk's profits and accumulated wealth could have been used to create more jobs, produce more innovative products which improves the lives of the consumer, donate to charity to assist the poor, and invest for future production and consumption. We can clearly see how the cost of redistribution vastly exceeds the benefits. Redistribution, the redistribution of wealth is robbery on a grand scale. The state steals money from an individual who earned it and gives it to someone who had nothing to do with the wealth he was given. The redistribution of wealth discourages innovation, production, creation, and growth and encourages laziness and abusing the system to live off someone else's wealth without working a day in your life. The redistribution of wealth discourages enterprise because you don't keep the fruits of your own labor. Before moving on to the subject of private property, I will discuss collectivism and individualism, and how equality can only be enforced using collectivism. Socialism advocates for equality, meaning that people should receive the same thing for the same type of work. Socialism is also when people have equal access to goods and capital, meaning that everyone would essentially have the same thing. This is ludicrous, as every individual has distinct goals, desires, skills, attributes, demands, values, preferences, and many, many, many other differences. It is natural that people have different outcomes, even if you have the same job. Because you make different decisions of your money and you may work harder, you make more money and save money more efficiently. In e even in theory, you are... In theory, you are twins with a person working at the same job and working the exact same amount. You still may be paid differently due to how much a boss values your work, or a business owner rather. Since value is subjective, different people may value the same thing more or less depending on their, on their personal preferences. Before moving on to the subject, as opposed to collectivism, only the individual should be able to decide what to do with their own life and should not be forced to serve the ends of the collective. A collective cannot act. A collective is not an entity. 
only the individual acts. And even if he's within a collective, only the individual acts. The only way to possibly benefit the community or society in a meaningful way is to let the individual freely act to achieve his own self-interest. This will make the individuals richer, happier, and will lead to a more prosperous society. Not forcing people to work for the benefit of people with power and authority over, over a community or collective. The final and most important element of socialism is the abolition of private property. Some socialists do indeed make the distinction between personal and private property. For them, personal property means material goods that one is currently using for personal consumption and private property is material goods that one is not that one is currently using for wealth production and they consider it differently be because one for them is ethical whereas the other one isn't and it's a completely an arbitrary difference in practice however in practice personal property and private property are the same thing personal property such as food water clothes and a home and private property, such as factories, should still be protected the same way before the law. If you spend money on a house, and you are currently renting it to someone, what is the difference between that and buying a house to live in? In both cases, you still spend your hard-earned money to buy the house. But, you use, but if you use one for a different reason than another, it is suddenly no longer your property, according to socialists. It does not matter what you are using your property for. If you are in ownership of it, only you can decide what to do with it, and no one can take it forcibly take it away with it or steal it from you. The distinction between personal and private property is utterly senseless, as in both cases you have received ownership of the property through trade, inheritance, or homesteading. The rational basis of property rights is the recognition that an individual needs to be able to use, consume, and control physical goods and the products of their own labor to survive and prosper. Property rights are essential to a capitalist economy as it grants the individual an exclusive right to have control over what he owns, either to consume or generate wealth. The only way that property can be exchanged is through voluntary transactions. These include rent, sales, inheritances, or charity. Property rights is crucial to not only the economy, but personal freedom as well. Property rights means that a person has self-ownership over himself, and he can do as, his, he, can do as he pleases without violating this right himself. Without self-ownership, individuals will be slaves and were not allowed to do anything by a collective entity such as the state. Recognizing that you own yourself and no one can take away that right is one of the most important doctrines, as it is the foundation of not only our civilization, but human life. Property rights are a synonym of individualism. Both ensure freedom for the individual to act and pursue their own self-interests, as long as they don't violate the property rights of others. On the other hand, in a socialist system, Property rights could be abolished, or would be abolished rather, and would be replaced with a system of common or collective property. This basically means that no one really owns anything, and property can be used by anyone, in theory. Under the system, an individual doesn't have the right to the products of their own labor, of their labor, or capital, and it will be shared among everybody. This, by all definitions, is theft as people in the community who had nothing to do with making the product or wealth get a portion of it, and the creator of the wealth only gets the same portion, even though he created the product. Under a system of common property, there is little incentive for production innovation as you don't even keep the products and wealth of your own labor. This ties in with collectivism and eco-redistribution, in that these principles are all very flawed and discourages productive behavior and encourages relying on the labor of others, Although all of this theory has more flaws than you can count, socialism is far worse than what it sounds based off the script. Since private property and keeping the profits of your actions is a and keeping the profits of your actions is a natural process, a powerful collective needs to take control of people's life and property. The most powerful and well-known group of people with the exclusive right to initiate violence and aggression on a given territory that it controls is the state socialism is not a voluntary thing as some may th as some may think you to believe it requires the use of the state to enforce it the real definition of socialism without any of that super fancy theories is when the government which is the most powerful collective entity 
owns the means of production and thus controls the actions of individuals and the economy. Next time, I will explain how socialism works in practice and why people should fear the word socialism.